Okay, welcome to session two of the Utah Cultural News Hour. And tonight we're talking about the Chinese people in Utah. The first arrivals came as workers on the Central Pacific Railroad. They were building the railroad from Sacramento to Promontory Point, where they were going to meet with the Union Pacific Railroad, which was coming in from the east. More than 10,000 Chinese. Some of the numbers say as high as 14,000. It's hard to document, but at least 10,000 worked for the um, Central Pacific Railroad, a lot of them from South China because there was a lot of turmoil in that area at that time. It um, followed the Humboldt River, went across Nevada, went across the desert in Utah, and then met at Promontory Summit in Utah. The statistics show nine out of every ten men who built that Southern Pacific Railroad were Chinese. And they developed a reputation for their reliability and their industrious work ethic. But they lived in segregated quarters. And it named some of the camps here, Lucent and Terrace, but really there were camps every 10 miles as the rails were being built. And the reason it's one in 10 is because there's a ceiling. A Chinese laborer cannot go above a laborer. He can never become a foreman or any kind of administrator. We do see in the um, employment roles, there are some Chinese blacksmiths and assistant blacksmiths and cooks and waiters and, and like that. But, but they're, even for the same job, they're getting paid less than the men from Ireland or the men from the United States. Um, most of the railroad foremen are Irish or of Irish descent born in the U.S. Golden Spike, a very famous nail, was um, the last intersection. What happened was you get to that meeting point, the last, second to last rail is laid by the Irish crew from Union Pacific mm -hmm. from the east, and then the last rail mm -hmm. is laid by the Chinese crew yes. from the Central Pacific, the Central Pacific Railroad from the west. And then the dudes in suits come out to drive the last spike in, and they can't do it. And they try about 12 times. And then the foreman of the Chinese crew comes in and thumps it in, and it's all good. So, yeah, because Tyson suits don't know how to wield a, a really heavy sledgehammer. Between 1870 and 1880, the greatest population of Chinese in the state of Utah lived in Box Elder County because that whole railroad line from Promontory to Nevada border is in Box Elder County. And so you've got railroad stations about every 10 or 12 miles, and each station has a Chinese crew of 10 or 12 guys, a couple of Irish or U.S. foremen, and, and then the merchants start coming in and setting up stores at all these stations along the way, too, to provide goods and services. Corinne is the town, the only town anymore, that exists between Promontory Summit, where the railroads join, and Highway 15, running through North and South of Utah. It was a railroad center. Welcome, Margaret. Welcome. It was a railroad center and a big community. There's a really nice museum at Corinth that has the artifacts from a Chinese laundry as well as some um, railroad cars and engines and stuff. It's, it's a big deal there. Terrace is one of those communities where, where there was a railroad station and so the railroad, could, the train could stop and refill, because it's a steam engine, has to refill every 10 or 12 miles. But also, they provide the um, maintenance for the tracks. And so, Kelton and um, 
Paris are, are some of the places that we know about. This is Cutson and Terrace are, are just west of Pomatory. You're headed toward the Nevada border there. There were 54 Chinese men living here in 1880. Yes, they're Chinese men because the women aren't allowed to come. And so it's a problem. The census records, when you read them, you hear the stories about Chinese coolies working on the railroad. They're not coolies. They know how to read and write. And that's why they were able to open businesses when they opted to, to need labor for the railroad, to open their own businesses in all these little frontier towns across Utah. So, so there you are. They could read and write. They had skills. And they took advantage of the opportunities. They came in with the railroad. That was one opportunity. And then they spread out all over Utah and started businesses and raised their families in these little towns all over Utah. Ogden had 33 Chinese people living there in 1880, and it went up to 106 in 1890. I think part of that's because they're trickling in from other places along the railroad and, and even in from California. Because because the Exclusion Act is 82, so you're not getting any new guys in from China. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're pretty much confined to 25th Street between these two streets, and there were laundries and restaurants, and, and it was a real cultural hub for Chinese people in Ogden. This is a, a parade in Ogden in the 1940s, I think. So there's an extant population there. Salt Lake City, since 1900, the most Chinese in one place in Utah are in Salt Lake City. And in 1890, the census said there were 271 people here. I love this dragon. This is from a parade, and this sign says Pioneer Days Parade, and there's some dispute about whether it really is that particular parade, but it is just before 1900. And, and you can see everybody's turned out in all their finery to see the parade. This is another parade in Salt Lake City, which is probably during the 1890s. And apparently, one of the traditions among the Chinese community is to create this dragon that's made up of Chinese people. And at some point, it was said to be as long as 200 feet. And you can see all the feet underneath that dragon as it winds its way down the street. Park City also had a sizable Chinese community, 131 in um, the 1890 census. Um, the railroads coming into Park City were in part constructed with Chinese labor. After the Transcontinental Railroad is completed, then they scattered to do other jobs in other places in Utah, but one of the things they a lot of men stayed with railroad work and because there were a lot of other railroad lines being built all over Utah, north, south, east, west, every direction. But one of the big priorities for railroads was to get up to the mines, to get the ore out and, and to increase um, export of ore, coal. Mercur is a little town, um, a mining town, one of the most famous Chinese men who lived there was called Doc Chinaman. And um, he did Chinese herbal medicine and owned a laundry that, that hired other Chinese men to work there. And he was rather famous in the community and did very well for himself. Carbon County, during the 1880s, um, there was a group of Chinese people who were working as coal miners out there. But there were others who ran laundries and sold vegetables and repaired cane bottom chairs. I thought that was an interesting specific to pull out of a history book. Yes. Yeah. So most of the Chinese is just really off the railroad. Completely. Yes. Right. It's yes, not they're coming in with the railroad. Right. Before that, there, there's Before no record that, there of there are no Chinese, Chinese people oh. at all. What, what yeah. year that Chinese people started to come here? 1869 with the railroad. 1869. Right. Okay. Right. So, so the railroad is just really the beginning for the, the Chinese people. The railroad is is the key that opens the door. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. And all yes, the Chinese.
HIVs come in, other groups are coming in too. Right. But um, but that's really the key for the Chinese people in Utah. Fort Duchesne um, was originally a frontier fort, but there was a, a man who was Chinese who, his name is there, Wong Sing. He opened the laundry, but his business grew so much that by the 1920s, it was a big mercantile store and stuff. So he did real well for himself there too. Silver Reef is all the way down by St. George. And you can see on this um, roster of businesses in Silver Reef that there are Chinese people and they're running laundries and restaurants and all that. So that's a really big deal too. And, and there's more families down here. I don't know how they were able to accomplish that, but they did. The Citizenship Acts of 1790 and 1870 limited citizenship in the United States to white people and after 1870, people of African descent, which completely locks out any Asians and a lot of Southern Europeans who are considered too dark. In 1868, though, there's a constitutional amendment that says if you're born here, you're a U.S. citizen. So that's impetus enough to bring immigrants into this country, to make a better life for their children, even if they know that there are limitations to what they can accomplish here. And that's true even today. I have some dear Bosnian friends who knew when they left Bosnia they could never teach in this country. Their language skills would never be up to it and they'd have to get recertified and all that stuff. But for their children, their children could grow up here and go to college here and get good jobs here and it's worked out very well for them. Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 said there is no immigration of Chinese laborers at all. And it was the first law that prevented a specific ethnic group from coming into the United States. It was repealed in 1943, but by then the quotas that went into place in 1924 that we're gonna talk about next were already in place. So there's a limit to how many people can come in. Oops, okay, I guess we're talking about discrimination first. 1902 and 03, the Miners Union in Park City campaigned to boycott Chinese restaurants and laundries and, and all this other stuff. And there's this great fear and, and you, you put out these big posters with these horrendous images on them to scare everybody away. And, and that was part of what the Chinese people living here had to deal with. Um, in the 1900, 1930s, Around, this is Salt Lake City, this is Plum Alley, which isn't really there anymore, but there's a, a marker. Um, and this is where all the Chinese businesses were, and there was quite a, a group of people here, and, um, and they did not laundries and restaurants and all kinds of Chinese businesses. Yes, Margaret? Do you have any picture at Plum Alley? What information do you this have is, Plum Alley? I have two pictures of Plum Alley and they both look like this. That's it. I have some newspaper about Plum Alley. Maybe I, would I can share that. that. I would love to yeah, see newspaper. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The other one I think is taken looking in the other direction, but it, but it looks the same. And so in the other picture you can see there's a row of buildings on this side and, and pretty much nothing on the other side. And it's really this dirt, gutter running through it. So you can see the wooden um, sidewalks up here. So you can knock the mud off your shoes before you go in the store, but uh, yeah. But that's, a lot of the streets in Salt Lake look like that. This isn't the only one. This, at this time frame, you've got a lot of dirt streets. This is that 1924 <coughs> Immigration Act. It set quotas. But the quotas were set based on the population in 1890, and the limits were 2% of the population of that particular ethnic group in 1890. So they seriously affected immigration of not only Asians, but Jews, 
and um, people from South America, and um, people from Southern Europe. So it's a problem, and it wasn't changed until 1965, which follows with um, the Equal Rights Amendment in 64, and, and just goes in on its coattails, so that in 65, all those restrictions are removed. You want me to add something for the 65? Add something. Yeah, in 1965, uh, though, uh, uh, that's the first time they, they left the, uh, the, the uh, tidy the, the exclusion up, yes. right? Yes. 1965. 1965. So since that time, we, you know, we are paper and sun paper. Yes. You know paper and sun? Yes. Uh, we are two, my husband, them paper and sun. Uh. At that time, Everybody, you they can go to the immigration. You you tell them, uh, you they they tell them you the paper son, and they excuse you. Wow. That time we did that too. What what's the paper son? Paper son. Uh -huh. Yeah. So for suppose you, uh, your grandfather, uh -huh. you go back to China. Right. And and they allow you go back to China, then you come back. Right. And once you if you go back two year, uh -huh. and they and say they have three children, uh -huh. they have three children. Right. Actually, they back have no back children. Back in China. Back right. in China. Right. They have no children, you know. But they say I have three children. I have three boys. Okay. They don't want girl. They say boys. I have three boys. Those are false paper. Oh, right. okay. Then those false paper, I can sell it to anyone. Right. One thousand dollar for year eight or two thousand. Right. I don't know how much right. they sell. Right. So everybody buy the paper. So to pretend, to pretend they are the father, they are mother, right. then they come over, that's called the paper son, gotcha. not the gotcha. real son, okay. the paper yeah. son. Okay. So and that's how they were able to come yeah. and give you that. Sorry, 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 okay. sorry. sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> but that will be until 19, uh, 1965. Until 1965, um, there are a lot of Chinese coming into this country with, with false papers. Okay. Before, so, so in another word, before, any, yeah, exclusion act, it means that there's no the new people. No new, new people. Right. So, so if you, you have a relationship. You could be a returning person right. or you could be a family gotcha. member. Gotcha. But even then there are restrictions. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I love this paper. This is Da Xie is what? How do you say Da Xie? Da. Da Da Xie. ในในในไม่อยู่จุ้ยล่ะในในแล้วทําไว้จะไม่อยู่จุ้ยล่ะอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ
particularly for Chinese people, had so many limitations on what they could do, is that serving in the Army got you the GI Bill when you came out, and so then you could go to college, and you could do some of these things that were just almost impossible to do before, because you could never earn enough money because you could get, enough, get a good enough job. Yeah, my, so. my husband's two brother and my uh, and the uncle, they go to uh, Germany. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, they're the cook, two of them the cook. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed. This is 1952. Anyway, um, and so more people were able to come into this country, although still not too many because there are still those quotas going on. But there are more um, students coming in to study here, and some of them end up saying. Um, and so we end up increasing our population of very educated, very accomplished Chinese people in the state of Utah. In the 1960s and 70s, particularly, you see, the, it talks about, uh, there's a census, and it says in 1970, almost half of the Chinese people living in Utah are cooks, busboys, waiters, yada, yada, yada. But the picture I found is grad students. So they're probably working as cooks, busboys, and waiters while they're going to school. <laughs> but job. but yeah. really, they're not just menial laborers. They're a whole lot more than that. No, I'm here in 1962. 1962? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, when I came, the only a few hundred uh, population only. Yeah, not very many at all. That as we go, can you go back? Let me see what the. I can go back. You cannot go back? Yes, I can. Yeah. Let okay. me see what's the population you say there. 1,281. Uh, 1, in yeah, then I came about 60. They only few hundred, only, only few oh, families. Yeah, because there's a big, yeah, see, a big there, yeah. influx yeah. after 65. Yeah, two, uh, because two, uh, suddenly uh, people's wives could come over and, uh, yeah. and families could come over. Oh, only few family. Yeah, right. I can name the family too. Yeah, not mm -hmm. too many here. Yeah, see? Yeah. It's been long, old time, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> you know the history here. I know the history. Really. It's a yeah. wonderful thing. Uh, 700 something, 758 people. 1200, 1200. 1281. Okay. Okay. I like to write down those. Okay. Margaret's going to write it down. Yeah. So the bottom line is with It's my history. It's 60. I'm here 62. It's you. <laughs> With this influx of more people from China and, and people able to get an education and no longer having those limitations on what kind of jobs they can have and yeah. oh, oh, how you, many people. It's kind of right of most the restaurant owner when I, I'm here. Only yeah. one doctor. Only one doctor? Yeah, at that time. Yeah. But much more now. <laughs> yes. So to now. We not only have the children, the descendants of those original Chinese rail workers, but we also have people who come in since then from all over China, really, and and who now um, hold all kinds of positions in the state, a whole lot more than the laborers who came in to begin with. Most of my pictures and stuff came from the University of Utah Marriott, Library, Utah State Historical Society, Weber State University Stewart Library. And um, many thanks to them for making those photos available. It is hard to find photos of Chinese It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good Thank you. It's I like good it. to know. It's a good to know. Yeah. You did good. a very good research. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank ah. you for joining us this evening. Next month, we'll talk about enemy aliens during World War II in Utah. Oh, thank you again. So